What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. Is it a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this place. No one. That's, whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. All year long, you write us letters, emails, and even send us carrier pigeons asking the naked archaeologist questions. And today, we're going to answer some of them. My staff has chosen a few letters out of the thousands you've sent us. And today is your day. Thank you, and here we go. The first naked archaeologist question is, dear naked archaeologist, you seem to like to solve biblical questions with the archaeology. So here is a head scratcher for you. In Genesis 30, <laughs> it says, Leah went out to meet Jacob and said, I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. Why would someone trade mandrakes for sex? You know, it's a very good question and, you know, one of the big Bible stumpers of all time, but I have a theory about that. It has to do with the Hebrew for mandrakes, Dudaim, and the Hittites, who hail from Turkey. So let's go to Istanbul to figure this one out. The Archaeological Museum of Istanbul, oops, sorry, no, it's a priceless artifact. This is where the greatest Hittite collection exists. Come over here. Look at this. These are Hittite inscriptions. What you have here, incantation against impotence. If a guy has some difficulty with his lady, he should get the saliva from a bull with an erection. I mean, the bull has to have an erection. The guy has the, pro the problem or he wouldn't be looking for. Anyway, if that's not hard enough, he has to find the saliva of a sheep with an erection. And then he's got to take the saliva of a goat with an erection. He's got to mix all this stuff up together and drink it. If you can't get all that saliva from all these different animals with erections, there is a fallback position. If a man's potency comes to an end in the month of Nisanu, which is April, you catch a male partridge, you pluck its wings, and then you pound it up together with mountain dadunu plant. You give it to him to drink and beer, and then the man will get potency. Hey! What does this have to do with the Bible? Let me tell you. In the Bible, it says that, you know, Jacob, who becomes Israel, the father of the tribes, he had two wives, Leah and Rachel. Leah, he didn't love her as much as Rachel, but she had lots of kids. Rachel couldn't have kids. And there's one episode in the Bible that says the oldest son of Leah, Reuven, went to the fields and he found Dudaim in Hebrew. Dudaim plant and he brought it to his mother. Now Rachel says, give me that plant. And Leah says, no way. And Rachel says, I'll give you my husband for tonight, give me the plant. Nobody could figure out why would she trade her husband for a plant. The answer is in this Hittite inscription, the Dadunu plant. That's the same as the Dudaim. It's a solution against impotence, but I bet you also against infertility. We actually figure out something in the Bible by coming to this inscription. Just what I was going to say. You didn't think I'd solve that one, did you? If it were anyone but you, I wouldn't believe it. I have a problem with the way my daughter dresses. Clothes are becoming more revealing every year. Tell my daughter she can look back in history and see that today's fashions have actually gone too far. Well, I'm not sure that would help. Because if your daughter looks to history, she might end up with a role model like Nefertiti. So you know what? Let's go to En Gedi. There we'll meet best-selling author Michelle Moran. And she's written a book about Cleopatra and Nefertiti. Uh, according to the tomb pictures, they seem to be some hot babes there. Yeah. <laughs> her blue crown. Nefertiti and her famous limestone bust in Berlin. That was actually probably leather. She had shaved her hair completely so that this tight-fitting crown could remain in place. Nefertiti and leather. Nefertiti. She was completely bald. Yeah, yes. <laughs> she liked leather. And she wore open-breasted garments. But it's not uh, topless. Um, some of them were topless, yes. Really? No. Yeah. And bald. And bald. 
bald. So basically, if your daughter isn't bald and topless, you're ahead of the game. Just what I was gonna say. He's a tall, tall man. He's a tall, tall man. All right. Today, by the way, we're answering your letters, and we're going to the ends of the earth to find out what you want to know. Because today, you're in charge. So let's see what you have to say. Uh, isn't it about time you got a new hat? Okay, forget what I said about you being in charge. What I say goes, see? No, oh, I love this hat. Actually, it's a kippa. Okay, so it doesn't always make my hair look so good. How's a kippa? This flipping out weird. How's my hair? Okay. <laughs> what did people in the ancient world do for fun? Good question. One thing we know they did for fun was they had sex. How do I know? Because we're here. But you know what? This is about archaeology, so let's look for the evidence. In 1500 BCE, someone in Egypt painted this. These people are not playing pinochle. The Jewish sex? The ancient... Jewish sex? The sex. This is ancient religious sex. It looks old, really old. 2000 BC. No. Yeah. This is 4,000 years old. And the ancients played sports. Here's the evidence, although it looks suspiciously like sex. But they had fun in other ways. Actually, some forms of entertainment in the ancient world weren't that different from what we have today. I'm on my way to Enyael, just outside of Jerusalem, to learn about Roman fun from Denis Latopolsky at the Living Museum. And, hopefully, I'll be living when I leave. So, you want to know what the ancients did for fun? They did what we do for fun. They bashed each other in the head. It's blunt? It's almost blunt. But it could still hurt you. You want to try Oh, I'll try that. OK. I don't want to embarrass you or anything. You understand that I'm like a natural at this. So. Ready? Ah, you, you weren't paying attention. All right, all right, all right. I'm getting really, really up. Oh, I see. Oh, all right. I'm stopping to toy with this man. Oh, 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 oh. I'm toying. I got you yeah. good. Until you pick up a sword and start doing this, you don't know. But the Romans also brought their kind of sport to Israel when they ruled here. 2,000 years ago, there was a guy named Herod who liked to build big. And his two biggest projects were expanding the temple in Jerusalem to keep the religious people happy and recreating Roman fun where I'm headed now, up the Mediterranean coast in Caesarea. Up here, he made a Roman kind of place with all the fun from home. Archaeologist Yosef Porat has excavated the first stadium or hippodrome to be found in the Holy Land, Herod's Hippo. This is a uh, circus or hippodrome, mainly for chariot races. So if, if it was a big performance, you think about 10,000 people were able to sit here? Yes. They're bringing my horse. I'm going to learn how to ride a chariot. <laughs> He's farting. <laughs> this horse has gas. When I got there and the horse started running, I thought, you know, this isn't funny. We can overturn, you know? I mean, was it dangerous? There were clashes. <laughs> if they drive uh, fast, they can simply falling apart. <laughs> and then the horses keep running. <laughs> and somebody else oh. can uh, step over Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> what a terrible Same. way to go, eh? But it wasn't just blood and guts there was a theater nearby. Stories about blood and guts. Wow, there's a modern Old. performance in an ancient theater. Look at that. Doesn't that look nice? What is mentioned in Josephus Flavius, for example, a stand-up comedy. There was stand-up comedy here? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yes. So this guy goes to a pet shop and he says, I'd like a dog for my son. And the pet shop owner says, sorry, don't do exchanges. <laughs> <laughs> you know, today we go to movie theaters, there's a lot of uh, violence, but it, it, it's all pretend. 
some of the performances were the same in ancient time. Some were really real. Violent? Yes. So part of entertainment was execution? Yes. Some kind of fun hasn't changed. But the ancients blurred the lines a bit by adding executions to the entertainment. I guess they figured if you've got the audience there already, give them their money's worth. Here's one. Speaking of archaeology, how old is your keeper? Okay, I can take a hint. It's a bit dusty. It's been on a few archaeological digs. Maybe it's time I find a new one. I got such a giant head, I can't find one that fits. This is pretty big, but I don't think it's me. Is there a mirror here? Oh, my God. It's the wrong shape. I don't think it works. I'm going to tell people the secret of this keeper. Yes. Everybody wants to know where I bought it. I bought it here. Where does it come from? This is Bukhara. Uzbekistan, Bukhara. right? Yes. Now, you know what the trouble is? All the other ones are small, and, <laughs> and this one's giant. I have only for baby now, only for children. Can I fix my old one with the, with the baby one? Try if you can do it. It's okay. You need to buy two to make one. I think the only thing that's left for me to do is to find a master tailor and combine them. Do we have to go through with it? Too late to call it off now. He's a tall, tall man. He's a tall, tall man. You write the naked archaeologist so many letters, and today I'm answering them. At least some of them. And here is one. Naked archaeologist, is archaeology dangerous? Not really. Here's one. How do we know how far back in time the people of Israel go? It's a very interesting question, because the fact is that the first inscription, the first time the word Israel referring to a people appears, is in a hieroglyphic that's 3,200 years old. It's part of a stele called the Merneptis Stele. It's in the Cairo Museum. And to answer this question, we're going to go there. In 1896, a victory stele was found. It's a stone plaque dated to 1209 BCE, and in it, the Egyptian pharaoh at the time, Merneptah, boasts of having defeated Israel. How do we know he means the people and not just the place? On the very bottom of that, it was immediately recognized was this final unit describing a campaign against Canaan. Israel is laid waste. Its seed is not. Israel is spelled out uh, with a people determinative, a seated man and a seated woman over three strokes. Since hieroglyphics communicate their meaning in pictures, and here we see the word Israel seated, it means they are a settled people. And by saying their seed is not, Merneptah is either referring to their offspring or their grain. Either way, he's proving that they're already a people. So there you go, archaeological proof that in 1209 BC, the people of Israel were around. But you know, that inscription actually proves that they were around even before that, because the inscription calls Israel a people. And you can't become a people in 10 days. You've got to be around for, I don't know, 300 years before you can amalgamate as a people. So the Merneptah Stele proves that the people of Israel are at least 3,500 years old, a little older than my keeper. Nobody has a head as big as the naked archaeologist. It takes two, not one. See? Ooh, come on. on the street, there's Abu Hassan the tailor. He can put two together. Thank you very much. Taylor. Ayat. That way? Okay. Via the Rasa? Three. Oh, I see a sign. We're, we're, we're doing good here. That way? Yeah. Come. It's a tailor. Make one big one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a look. I got a new keeper. It doesn't care. This is older. So which one do you like better? I like this one. You like the older one? The older one. 
Me too. Has more character. more character. I feel the same way. <laughs> These questions are incredible, so let's see what this one says. This says, my friend, bet me that you couldn't find five archaeologically important artifacts in a single hour. Look at these stones. You see these stones? These stones are ancient. They were found in 1977 when they were doing renovations of the street. They date back to the middle of the third century. You know, so we're talking about 1,700-year-old stones. That looks good. From Jericho, this one. From Jericho? Yes. Do you know that Jericho is where they found the oldest city fortifications anywhere in the world? The oldest. You know where they got this image? Yes from the Arch of Titus in Rome. Uh -huh. So you didn't know there was so much archaeology behind your magnets. Uh -huh. This is a crown thorns, of thorns. Crown of thorns. It's not the original. original. This is the original? Yeah. How could you have two of the original? St. Helena Road. Helena was Constantine's mom. You know the city inside out. More or less. But you know that that ATM is actually connected to archaeology? Yeah. And I'm not joking. Over there, they found the earliest piece of blown glass ever found on the planet. It was found in a ritual bath. And in this mikveh, somebody must have had a little shop for glass and was tossing all his experimentation. There was failed pieces, so right? There was fa failed little pieces that mm -hmm. show the process of blowing glass. By the Middle Ages, for example, Italian glass was really started by crusaders who brought Jewish families out of Jerusalem and brought them back to Italy to teach them glassmaking. And the earliest piece was found under the ATM machine. <laughs> hey, the, the ATM machine doesn't work. <laughs> Did I make it? A magician. He's a tall, tall man. He's a tall, tall man. Today, I'm answering your letters, and we're learning a lot about the Bible, archaeology, and you. So here we go. Let's see. Let's see what you have to say over here. We see a lot of depictions of Jesus' sandals in movies, but are any of them accurate? Do we know what Jesus wore on his feet? Well, we don't have Jesus' sandals, but you know what? we just may find sandals from Jesus' time or even before. The go-to person for sandals in the ancient world is Ori Chamir from the Israel Antiquities Authority. What do you got there? Some sandals from Masada. This is a sandal worn by one of the defenders yes. of Masada. And we a can Ju see... A Jewish Alamo, the, you know, yeah. give me freedom or give me death. Yeah. Well, you could see it's narrow, so you could see it's a, it's a woman's. Forty years after Jesus, the last holdouts of the Jewish rebellion against Rome ended up here at Masada. With the Romans closing in on them, they committed mass suicide rather than face slavery or execution. And the woman who wore this sandal was one of them. And Dorit has another surprise for me, a pair of sandals even older from the Cave of the Warrior. And you can see the sandals of the warrior. Oh, my goodness. We're talking 6,000 years here? Yes. 6,000 year old sandals. He was oh. very tall, 170 centimeters. He's giant. Yes. Very good preservation of sandals is uh, really is very, very rare. A pair of sandals from 4,000 years before the time of Jesus. This is the oldest evidence of humanity I've ever seen, and it's not stone or pottery, but clothing, which connects us directly to a person, real naked archaeology worn next to the skin until the end. And speaking of the end, one viewer writes in about ancient burial practices, saying, I know that before coffins, there were bone boxes. Of course you know, you watch the show, right? But you ask, what was there before that? Good question. And the archaeological evidence is in Jerusalem, right behind the Began Center. There they found a pile of bones dating to the time of King Solomon. And the expert is world-famous archaeologist, Professor Gabi Barkai. 
Now, uh, this uh, large hall here is uh, surrounded by entrances to the burial chambers. There is one here flanked on all sides by elevated benches with six headrests. One, two, three, four, five, six. They would leave their dead here, and the flesh would decompose, leaving only the bones. After about a year, they came back and they collected the bones and the burial gifts, and they deposited them down into this hollow, yeah. uh, which we call a repository, is the place in which the people in their lifetime could see the pile of the bones of their ancestors. It stresses the uh, power of family. It is very comforting. Very comforting. In fact, I gotta tell you, Gavi, I really feel some great energy here. I feel so good about it. I think I want to take a little lie down here. You know, this is a good place. I know. I just... You could also see they were shorter than I am. Is it comfortable? Ah, uh, yeah. Bye-bye. See you later. Wow. Imagine staying here for a year. My flesh would fall off, and all that would be left would be my bones and my keeper. Well, we all end up as archaeology, so if they ever come across me a long time from now, I'd like to be found with this on my head. Well, we've been to Egypt, to Turkey, and all over Israel to answer your questions. I want to thank you for the frequent flyer, walker, and donkey miles. <coughs> we have time for one more. Let's see, do we have another one? Yeah, we have one more. Look at this. What does it say? It's got even a photo in here. What does it say here? Hello, I'm a naked archaeologist too, and I've enclosed a photo. <laughs> does anyone vet these? <laughs>